That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Nightmare Alley, the 11th film directed by Guillermo del Toro, which is being released courtesy of Fox Searchlight, Disney, uh, on December 17th, 2021. I thought this movie was excellent. I did too. And I've been, I'm a huge fan of the original film in 1947, directed by Edmund Goulding. You can get a very nice copy of it on Criterion now. Uh, I saw that film on Criterion or in a theater? Um, it's based on the book by William Lindsay Gresham, uh, and for my birthday in 2019, I asked you to go along with me to a screening at the Egyptian in Hollywood. That's right. That's right. So that's where you saw it for the first time, but I've watched it several times since then because I love this film. And I really enjoyed the original. Yes. Which, and of course the original, uh, directed by Edmund Goulding stars Tyrone Power, Colleen Gray, aka the Leech Woman. Um, a, a, she the one who went to Hamlin? Yes. Uh, a great, which is where Nick went to college. Yes, a very great. Was uh, that too much information? Joan Blondell, uh, I, I think, in one of Joan Blondell's best performances as uh, Zena. Um, anyhow, what do you want to go through the story? Okay, the basic story. Bradley Cooper is a man who has fled his home after he essentially kills his father and burns his body, sets the house on fire. So he is fleeing when he finds a carnival. Mm -hmm. And he goes into the carnival kind of looking for work. He's offered work by the carnival owner, played by Willem Dafoe. Mm -hmm. Clem. While he's working there, he meets a psychic uh, played by Tony Collette. And who's married to a man. Mm -hmm. Pete, played by David Strait Aaron. And we find out that they sort of had this racket where they would like do like mentalist, psychic type shows where they would use like a secret language and hand gestures and inflections in their tone to sort of communicate with each other to impress the audience as if they have like psychic powers. But they've since had to stop because the husband is an alcoholic. Mm -hmm. So now their act is kind of low budget or whatever. But Bradley Cooper's character is sort of drawn to that. So he starts picking up all those tricks. In addition to that, there is another performer at the carnival played by Rooney Mara. Mm-hmm. Uh, Molly. And he sort of sees something in her. Like, he's attracted to her and sees that he can make something out of her. So he's learned this new skill set. He has this new person. He thinks he can make something up. And he wants to leave with her. But before he does, he accidentally gives the alcoholic Pete some wood liquor mm -hmm. which kills him mm -hmm. so he has that on his conscience and he's able to acquire Pete's kind of book, book of, of secrets and yeah. codes okay so we fast forward two years yes and Bradley Cooper and Rooney Mara have this successful act when one day they're performing in this beautiful like club and a judge gets red mm -hmm. and is very moved by it but also at the table with this judge is Kate Blanchett's character, who's a psychologist. Lilith Ritter. And she basically says, like, I want to meet with you. And then they have some sort of instant connection. And she says, I think I can help you because I know what you're doing. Because she understands that it's not real. He's just playing mind games. She's like, well, I have recorded all of my sessions with all of my patients, some of whom are very powerful people. So if I give you some information to help you do readings on them, you can give me information, which basically all she wants is for him to tell her about himself, like the truth. Mm -hmm. Okay. To wrap it up, there's a very powerful man in the town or city, wherever they are. Ezra Grindle, played by Richard Jenkins. And he summons Bradley Cooper's character saying he wants a reading. And basically, this man wants to, like, have the spirit of his ex-lady, like, uh, reincarnated in front of him. Like, he wants Bradley Cooper's character to, like, manifest this lady. Yes. Which makes no damn sense. But he thinks because he's rich and powerful and he's an awful person, he can make it happen. Mm -hmm. So, Bradley Cooper, uh, a bulk of the film is him finding out all these secrets about this rich man. Because the rich man is, like, notoriously private... So he's like doing all this research to find out all these things. But the gag is 
this lady, this dead lady who he wants manifested, looks just like Rooney Mara. If you squint, yeah. If you squint. Because they're going to have drawings. Right. Well, in one photograph. So the gag is they dress her up as this woman and Bradley Cooper's doing this like elaborate thing. And he's hoping what he can do is get the rich man to see her from like 20 paces away. And then he'll be in shock and then he can get him to get down on his knees and pray. And then the lady will run off. But of course, this rich asshole man is not going to do what he's told. So he runs towards her, grabs her and realizes it's not her. So he's like, I'm going to destroy you. I'm going to ruin you. And then Bradley Cooper kills that man. And his assistant. And his assistant. So now Rooney Mara is like, well, I'm done with you. So she leaves. Bradley Cooper goes back to Kate Blanchett. And then we find out she's been playing him the entire time. She wanted to destroy him, which we can get into the reasons why. So she steals all his money, shoots him in the ear, and now he's on the run from the police. So she, now... Because of her, he, she's also uh, made him an alcoholic. We can get into that too. So Bradley Cooper's on the run again, and he ends up back at the carnival. But what I didn't mention is in the opening of the film, they, they call them geeks, which are like the people in the carnival who are like half man, half beast, and they're treated in a very inhumane way. And their thing is to bite the heads off chickens and drink their blood. Yeah, it's pretty great. We can get into that too. But Willem Dafoe's character explains to Bradley Cooper right away, like, this is how you get a geek. You find someone vulnerable who's probably an alcoholic and you do all these things and say all these things to them and eventually you'll break them. So at the end of the film, when Bradley Cooper's character stumbles back into a carnival looking homeless and destitute, the carnival owner who's played by Tim Blake Nelson starts saying the same shit to him. Mm -hmm. And then we see Bradley Cooper saying like, yeah. Like, I'll basically be a geek. Well, he said that I... He's like, 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 I was made I to was do that. I was born for it. Yeah, mm -hmm. the end. And that's a complicated story, and there's so much more to it. Oh, there are so many... I love this story. And uh, William Lindsay Gresham, who wrote it, was also an alcoholic and died miserably. So this was written by somebody that knows, like, the darkness of the human soul. <laughs> and I think that ruining this story, I don't think is really ruining it, because it's almost... It's a dance. It feels like a, a dance of manipulation. It's about hubris and, and selfishness and fate. Well, and even when I first watched the original, it's, it's like very obvious that like this man, because just knowing how stories like that were told back in that time where there always had to be like redemption and punishment and like, you know, he's going to end up fucked up. Well, in, in the original, the, so what Del Toro does here is they give uh, Stanton Carlisle, that's Bradley Cooper, a... Um, a very uh, enriching background with just a little bit of flourish because Tyrone Power in the original it opens on him gazing down into the geek pit which we can't see on screen because it's 1947 only to come only come to find that he's really looking in the mirror by looking down there which I find interesting but I I love the kind of daddy issues they give him and how the psychology of the characters is uh, made more dimension three-dimensional in this because uh, it really nails into that essence of how we're really all the same and you only need to know a few details about somebody to be able to kind of wheedle your way in there and figure out what their traumas are and what buttons to push mm -hmm. I only have four notes um, I thought everyone did a really good job I think Bradley Cooper does an amazing job yeah. Uh, I also just in general really like Willem Dafoe. Yeah. And I think he does a phenomenal job. The way he's talking to everyone. <laughs> and then when he, there's a scene where he, because Bradley Cooper's character helps Willem's character catch the geek. So then he's like, oh, let me take you to breakfast and blah, blah, blah. Oh no, he helps him. The geek... The geek the, is always trying to run away. And then he ends up getting sick and he's on death's door. So they well, take him to like some sort of Salvation Army shit. And then you can see that Bradley Cooper's character is kind of like, we can't just leave him here. And Willem's like, don't act like you care. Like, let's just go get some let's steak. Let's go get steak. Let's go get some steak and eggs. And then the scene at the restaurant where Willem is explaining to him exactly how he does it is just like, wow. Like, he's telling all his secrets because he doesn't care. Like, mm -hmm. like I'm going to do what I do. Yes, it's the thing about... There will always be someone. Th this is a film very much about learned trades and shared secrets. Um, if Joan Blondell, Zena, I thought was very prominent, I think Tony Collette is a little more diminished uh, because they're strengthening this 
father uh, issue that Stan Carlyle has. So as uh, Peter, David Strait Aaron really, I think, comes to the forefront a bit more. And he has a really good scene where he's showing how to do the spook show, where you can see that he spooked Bradley Cooper by reading into what his watch means. And then, of course, Bradley uh, Cooper does the same thing to uh, the judge. to Kate Blanchett. Oh, and to Kate Blanchett, that, which is also an excellent scene. Oh, I another really good scene is the judge. Um, his whole reading is about their, his dead son, and his wife is played by Mary Steenburgen. Mm-hmm. I can't believe I knew that. I can't either, but very good. She's not scoring her. So, he, so the judge says, "Can you please come to my house and talk to my wife about our son?" And he explains like. What the son, you know, he's making up some bullshit. Well, who died the, on the battlefield? But but we find out that the reason the son the son didn't want to join the military. The, the the dad made him, and the mom didn't want him to go. So then, at the end of the film, Bradley Cooper and he references like, I think I saved their marriage. Then we see there's just a random scene towards the end where we see Mary Steenburgen and Steenburgen and the judge sitting like at the in their breakfast nook. And they just, it's a great scene because they're all friendly, like, hi, dear, hi, go, oh, you know, I was thinking about what old boy said about our son. And then this bitch gets up with a gun in her hand, shoots the judge, and everyone in the screening room gasped. Yeah, they did. Because yeah. she shot him dead in the head. And then she shoots herself in the eye because Bradley Cooper's character says, uh, your son wants you to know that one day we'll all be together. <laughs> that shit was good. But, but kind of, really getting delving into th- this is like that famous quote by Nietzsche about how if you stare into the abyss the abyss stares back into you this is this is like the warnings that Stan Carlyle goes well beyond like don't do this don't push this hard he's a very frustrating character because he can't help himself it's he like is. he's greedy and then he has hubris so he and he so he uses Xena to get basically Molly in this little life he wants. Molly's an innocent, kind of a naive girl that doesn't want to hurt people. Uh, but, you know, Kate Blanchett, who was, I think, played by Helen Walker in the original, that character is his match. She is a predator that's doing the same thing he is. Um, and he's just so... He's also naive because he needs to be more wary of her when he gives her the key to his undoing. And there are two scenes that I think were just so well done and subtle. There's the scene where he first kisses Tony Collette and she takes his cigarette. They have to share like this passionate cigarette kiss in the bathtub. And then Kate Blanchett, he refuses to drink. And Kate Blanchett, who also reads cues in people, is pressing down on why he won't drink. And she's always drinking brown liquor. And then finally, after they start working together, she takes a drink and then they share this passionate kiss and he starts drinking. And my one note I wrote down on that was contamination. She has, and that is his whole undoing. Yeah, it's very obvious that she is bothered by the likes of him because he reads her and then, you know. He reads her to filth, yeah. Yeah, and I think she sees him as like lesser, like he thinks he's a mentalist, but really I'm the shrink and I'm going to show him. And I would say the weakest part of the story to me is I know that that char- Bradley Cooper's character's hubris is what leads him to make these poor decisions. The only thing I didn't understand was when she says, well, actually, I think I do understand because she says, all you have to do is tell me about yourself, but you have to tell the truth and I'll know if you're not. And he agrees. But I, I guess the answer to that question is that he thought he could play her. Mm-hmm. I don't know that. Well, he, they- fool- he fooled her, made her look a fool in public. And said she didn't have any power. So she makes sure that he no, knows. Yes, I understand her motivation. I'm saying I don't understand why he so willingly just tells her his truth. Because it's their first session. And he tells her, like, yeah, there was this old man. He died from alcohol I gave him. And Well, she infers a lot. Yeah, but he question. confirms it. Yeah. So I, I guess I didn't quite understand how his character just succumbed or succumbed. Succumbs. Succumbs to her trickery. Because he thinks he's smarter and better. Y- we'll have yes. to talk about a, a, a woman doctor in the 1940s and just how men think, especially back sure. then. Sure. You know, he thought that he was playing her. Um, I don't have anything else. I, just, I love when, because he starts choking her and runs away and then uh, a cop asks if she's okay and she, the way her voice sounds, and she's like, I'll live. 
Oh, yeah, it was so good. I know you, we talked about this. You think she's just doing what she normally does? I really enjoy Kate Blanchett. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, uh, Paul Schrader always says that you can fuck up a movie by casting. This movie, I think, is perfectly cast. Even Rooney Mara, who I don't, who I think rubs me the wrong way sometimes in the Colleen Gray role, I thought she worked very well. Yeah. Oh, oh boy, Hellboy. What's his name? Ron Perlman, who, and you know, uh, I know. Del Toro directed mm -hmm. the Hellboy films. Yeah, he plays Bruno, who's basically the what the he's gatekeeper. supposed to protect Rooney Mara. Yeah, but he doesn't. <laughs> he's the strong man in the circus, and he's kind of a fool. But uh, there's just oh, I, it's just human psychology blended with genre and all the, the, the with the tarot and all of the foreboding. It's just pitch perfect and. I wasn't a fan of any of the marketing for this film, so I was a little nervous going into it, um, considering, you know, Del Toro's had his stuff torn apart before, like Mimic by the Weinsteins was completely taken out of his hands. Uh, and, you know, his lot, but the, I, I guess this is what Best Picture gets you. You can have total, complete creative control. Uh, I also want to shout out the co-writer of this script is Kim Morgan, uh, whose only previous credit is a Guy Madden film I really love from 2015 called The Forbidden Room. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I just, I'm so happy at how great this film was. I love the look. It was shot by Dan Lausen, uh, who of course shot um, Shape of Water and Crimson Peak, which is a Del Toro film I don't really like as much, but... What would you give it? I'd give it four and a half out of five. I would give it four out of five because we have to remember this is not an original story, so... <laughs> it's not an original story. I would recommend watching the original as the, well. But no, the original film is, uh, I think that's a masterpiece, yeah. but it was also of the time as well. And there are things sure. you can't see. Uh, and I think Del Toro does a really good job of uh, fleshing that out with these bits of like predicated on extreme violence that are kind of his signatures. Uh, and. And also having that be a seamless part of the story, because this is also two and a half hours, uh, and I like I this review. No, I'm just kidding. Loved every minute of it. Yeah, it was great. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Anything else? No. Bye. Bye. Bye.